Well, I'll tell you a little bit about the trip that I recently had in Europe and the Middle East. November the 26th, I left New York and flew to Denmark. My purpose for going to the northern part of Europe was to visit a number of branches where we are carrying on extensive expansion work. In 10 hours' time, I flew from New York City to Hamburg, Germany, and then they refueled and added a few passengers, left a few off, and within a half hour, we were in Copenhagen. In 1955, when we were over there with the big international convention, I made arrangements for getting some property and building a new Bethel home and printing plant. At the present time, we are doing our printing on the outside, and that is quite expensive. Our Bethel home is too small, and other people live into the same home with us. So it seemed advisable to build a new kingdom, a new Bethel home with a kingdom hall in it and a large printing plant. <clears throat> so this is underway. And I checked over the property and also handled some matters with our attorneys in connection with some problems we have in that country. Here in America, we can go about quite freely from house to house without any interference from the authorities. And this due to the fact that we have won many Supreme Court cases giving us freedom of speech and freedom of worship and freedom of press. But in Denmark, they have laws where no one can go from house to house on Sundays uh, distributing any kind of literature. Everything must be closed down. But our brothers, of course, only have opportunity of witnessing on Sundays, that is the majority of them. So we have gotten into trouble with the government because our brothers go from house to house and they claim it is selling. So the society is making arrangements now through our attorneys to establish two corporations, a printing society and also a religious society. We are a religious society now, but they claim that we are doing business and therefore come under tax laws and the laws of government which prohibit uh, distributing literature on Sundays. So we hope now to establish a printing society which will print the literature and send it out to the congregations and they will do all the business as it were. And of course, if any profits happen to be made in that corporation, we'll have to pay taxes but very likely we won't make any profits. <laughs> so uh, the religious society then will take care of the congregations as far as appointment of servants are concerned and the handling of meetings, but the congregations will buy, as it were, literature from the printing organization and place them with the congregational publishers at the same price that the congregation gets them for, then there is no business transaction. That is, no profit it will be made. Then our brothers will go out in the witness work on Sundays, the same as they are now, and offer literature. And the pioneers will do the same thing, and there will be no profit made on the part of our publishers, pioneers nor congregational publishers. And in that way, they cannot charge us with doing any business and we can carry on our witnessing work. At least our lawyers tell us that that is possible, and if it comes to a showdown, of course, then we'll take it to the courts. Our brothers are not disturbed in any way about carrying on this uh, ministry in Denmark in any manner the society prescribes. And they are very zealous, and they are doing a wonderful work. Denmark has probably more publishers per population than any other country in the world. On Tuesday night, while I was there, the brothers had arranged for a meeting at what they call the KB Hall, and over 6,000 persons were in attendance. They came from all parts of Denmark. I was only there a day and a half, but very busy, and then went on to Frankfurt by plane. Our brothers in our Wiesbaden branch home met me there, and we went to the branch office and immediately I started working on plans for a new building in uh, Germany. Our present Bethel home is too small and our printing plant is overcrowded. 
We were able to obtain some property next to us, but the city had determined to put a roadway right down the uh, next to our present printing plant, and that would have meant if we build on the property across the street, we would not be connected by hallways or bridges. The city finally decided, after much talk with them, that if we moved the street from where they had uh, located it beyond our next building and on our own property, then we could build right up against our present location. So uh, that was agreed to by the city. Now we're going to have a very fine uh, construction there because our new printing plant will be much larger. And then beyond that and next to the new street that the city will allow us to put in and around our building will be another Bethel home. We are also putting into this structure a large kingdom hall for the congregation that will meet with the Bethel family. I was there less than 24 hours, but in that time I talked to architects and we drew up plans and now they are completed and I have approved them and returned them. So probably this spring they will begin building in Germany. Then I flew on to Amsterdam, but before I could get my plane, which was delayed, I went into the city of Frankfurt with the brothers who had met me at my plane when I was leaving and I surprised a few of the congregations by walking in on them. It was their service meeting night, theocratic school, and also their service meeting following it. The first congregation we got to, they hadn't started yet, so no one was too much disturbed except surprised. So I opened the meeting and talked to them a half hour about experiences and work in other countries. But the second meeting we went to, the theocratic school was on and uh, the counselor was on the platform giving counsel to one of the students when the branch servant of Germany and Brother Frost and a number of prominent German brothers and myself walked in and we sat in the first row. <laughs> it was, uh, if Brother Friend thinks he puts uh, hard circumstances on his students, he ought to try that from some time. <laughs> but, uh, this theocratic uh, instructor was a bit uh, nervous and I asked the brother who was with me and who was my interpreter what he was saying at the time as I was interested. He says, I don't know and I don't think he does either. <laughs> well, finally the congregation servant came over to us and wanted to know if I wanted to speak, which I told him it was all right by me. And and he gave a sign to the brother who was giving counsel that he could sit down, and he was very glad. I know it isn't a nice thing to do, but then if you want to see some of your brothers, you've got to get into a meeting. Of course, the students here don't mind when I come in and listen to them recite. They're used to me. They like it, I think. <laughs> After that, I went out to the airport, and 40 minutes I was away for the Netherlands. The branch servant met me late at night at the airport, and the next day again, we discussed matters of building in that country. At the present time, we're printing the Watchtower and Awake magazine in our Brooklyn plant and shipping it over there, and they mail it to all of their subscribers. It's a much finer magazine than what we were having done over there in an outside printing plant. But we do want to do our own printing in uh, the Netherlands. As you know, Holland is a rather small country, and land is scarce. They have to make land. So they put up large dikes and pump the water out and then fill it in with sand and then put uh, good dirt on top of that and then they have their new farms and their new cities. But it's all very thoroughly controlled by the government. So anyone that wants to build must have permission from the city and after you get that you have to get permission from the national government in order to put up the structure that you think you need. We believe uh, that this spring we'll be able to get a piece of land just outside of Amsterdam. They are now filling it in with sand, and there when they build they have to drive 60 feet uh, uh, concrete columns or piles into the ground, and then they cut them off at a certain height, and then they build a solid flat slab of concrete on top of these pillars so that their building will not sink or give. They have to get down to a sure foundation. 
So that will have to be done when we build our structure too. But we hope within a short while now we'll be able to get the land. The building is pretty well designed on paper. And as soon as we get property, then we'll start a new structure there. I flew away from Amsterdam early Sunday morning and arrived at noon in London. Brother Hughes, Brother Reese met me at the airport and we went out to a new piece of land we purchased in what they call the Green Belt. It's a very beautiful spot. It's a piece of land that uh, you're not allowed to build on in the sense of putting up a lot of apartments and taking away the trees or the green grass. But there was quite a mansion on this property years ago, and we finally convinced the city that our building would take the place of that mansion and the garages and the greenhouses and other things that were on it, and we'd take up no more space. And uh, now we have designed a very beautiful structure, and it'll be surrounded by trees. It's just like in the center of seven acres of trees, and right adjoining it, another 12 acres of grass where we can raise cows or sheep or put in a garden or whatever we wish, but it must stay green. It will certainly be a change for our brothers in Britain to move away from 34 Craven Terrace, where have been for many, many years, and to get out in some green country. And I know our brothers in the home there appreciate the change very much. I just had word that we will begin building around February the 1st, so they'll probably have put their speed spades into the ground by now. While I was there for a few hours, I spent uh, up until midnight with the architect and going over all of the final designs and the selection of materials and that would go into the building. Early the next morning, I was away to Paris. Here again, we are carrying on a construction program. We bought some new property last year and we are putting up a six-story building and a printing plant. And on Monday night, we had a meeting in a large hall. There were about 2,500 of our brothers from all parts of France present. And I announced that we had purchased property and that soon we would be putting up this new structure. Well, they were delighted. France has a branch office in a very fine location, but it is much too small for the real expansion work that is going on there. In December, Spain, or rather France, uh, reached a new peak in publishers of over 10,000. That's the first time they have passed that mark. So within uh, one week's time, I visited these five branches, and in all of them worked on the matter of new buildings, printing plants, new Bethel homes, to take care of the great increase that is going on in all of these countries. From there, I flew southward to Rome, where I would meet the zone servant, Brother Hoffman, and go on to Greece. It was a very beautiful trip that morning because the skies were clear, and uh, when we were flying over the French Alps and over Mont Blanc, why you could see for miles all around. It was a very beautiful sight, and you can't help but think of the glories of Jehovah's kingdom and his throne even because of the majesty and the beauty that exist in these mountains, the French Alps. It wasn't long until we were out of the snow and on down into sunny Italy, and there the branch servant brother Sedaris and brother Hoffman met me, and while they were making changes in the plane, uh, I had an opportunity of talking an hour with both of them, and of course brother Hoffman joined me, and we went on to Greece that afternoon. This was the beginning of the trip as far as checking branch offices were concerned, meeting with missionaries and having conferences with them and attending assemblies. In Greece, I was wondering how we were going to meet all of the brothers that I would like to meet because five years ago when I was there, we had to visit many, many homes where small gatherings were called together and it had to be done secretly. The uh, Branch servant, however, was quite anxious to have a central meeting, if that was at all possible, so he did go to the police and uh, ask them if uh, they could have a theater in which to hold a three-hour assembly, if that was at all possible. And he told them that some very important people from America were coming to Greece, and certainly they should allow this man, Mr. Knorr, to speak. Uh, 
If it were not for America, why, Greece probably wouldn't be on the map today because of all the money that America spends in that country to keep it going and into the uh, western section of the Allies. So uh, the police, for some reason or other, said yes and gave Brother Idreus a permit to rent a theater and have a meeting for three hours on the morning after we arrived. Just a few days before we did get there, the police called up Brother Idreus and asked him to come down to the office because they wanted to see him. But purposely, he left his permit at home because he figured that when he gets there, they're going to ask to see it and they'd never give it back to him. And that's exactly what happened. He got down there and they asked him if he had his permit with him. He said, no. He said, well, we don't believe it's uh, good for you to make arrangements and we suggest that you do not make arrangements for that meeting. He says, we're not making any arrangements for that meeting. They're already made. They're finished. He says, we have sent invitations out to all parts of Greece, to all of our principal men in the country to come here, and many of them now are on their way, and we intend to have the meeting. They're all going to be there at that place at 9 o'clock in the morning. So uh, we expect to have it, and we're coming down to have the meeting, and we don't expect a cancellation. There are many Greek brothers in uh, Athens that have influence and are prominent and have friends, and a number of uh, representatives in their parliament called up the police the next day and told them about Jehovah's Witnesses and why they thought we ought to be allowed to have a meeting. Not for 28 years have Jehovah's Witnesses in Greece been able to meet together. And this was the one hope of their life. <laughs> These inquiring men who were speaking on behalf of the society wanted to know why the police wanted to cancel this meeting, and they told them that pressure was brought to bear from the Greek Orthodox uh, Church's office. So uh, they couldn't cancel the meeting. There was pressure from both sides, the Greek Church and also prominent men in politics who are friends of Jehovah's Witnesses, and they spoke on our behalf. So uh, when the morning came, why, we had our meeting. In the meantime, Brother Franz, had visited uh, Portugal and Spain, and he was in Rome at the time I landed there. And then uh, the next day he came on to Athens. So Brother Hoffman, the zone servant of that part of the country, Brother Franz, our vice president, and myself uh, had the wonderful privilege of speaking to practically all of the congregational servants and assistants and their wives that were with them uh, that morning. It was a wonderful sight to see that theater packed out, 1,200 persons present, the first time anything like that happened in 28 years. And our, jo our brothers were filled with joy. After the meeting was over, a number of them expressed the point that every time that they had assembled, even in small groups of 20 or 30, and a policeman was around, he was there to arrest them. But on this morning, there were about 20 policemen there all sent there to protect Jehovah's Witnesses so that no one else would disturb us. It was quite a different feeling for our brothers uh, here in Athens. That afternoon, well, I might say we spoke for three hours then, and uh, they were overjoyed. And that afternoon, uh, Brother Franz and I started out at 3 o'clock visiting homes going from one home to another, and we kept this up until nine in the evening, and we talked to more than 850 of our brothers in Athens and Piraeus. When I got back to the branch office, many of the branch ser or the congregational servants were in the branch office seeing it for the first time, and there were about 150 persons there. The branch office belongs to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. And that's one building the police have never disturbed. They've come in and checked up to see what's going on, but being American property, they have never molested us in that place. We even print the Watchtower, the books, other publications, and send them out throughout all of Greece and distribute. Even though all of our local congregations have trouble, still the branch office never has been disturbed by the police. We believe that that is because 
It is an American-owned corporation. Well, that evening when I returned from visiting these 850 brothers, I spoke to these servants. We had to have sort of a reception in case the police did come in because we mayn't have a meeting except by permission. It's quite customary to drink wine in Greece. They, every home has it and makes it so on the desks and on the tables while they had wine and coffee and cookies and other things, so it looked just like a little a reception. A few of the brothers who could play instruments uh, were at one end of the hallway uh, playing the violin and accordion and other instruments and entertaining. So when I came in, I talked to them for about a half hour, which was another great pleasure to me. Our uh, visit in Greece was most profitable because it gave us ample opportunity to check over all of their problems and for days talk to the branch servant and others in the office about how to better carry on the work. While there I visited the British consul, I had sent a wire from London to try and have a visa for Cyprus at the British consul's office in Athens, and when I called there it hadn't arrived yet, so I asked them to wire so that we could get into Cyprus. We had it scheduled on our trip, but because of the Suez trouble and also the trouble between the Greeks, Turks, and British in the island of Cyprus, it is quite difficult to get a visa. They would not grant it to us in New York. They ruled it out completely, but uh, we didn't stop at that. We tried through other countries. We had hopes of getting it, but I told Brother Idreus we would not return to Athens unless he wired or phoned me in Istanbul that the visa was there to pick up. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time to come back to Athens and on to Beirut, which was the next stop. So we flew away on our way to Istanbul, and after we were a half hour out, why, there was some trouble with the plane that we were in, so the pilot brought it back to the Athens airport. Uh, they took all of the luggage and baggage out of our plane and put it into another, and then the pilot took us up and took us on to Istanbul. I was told, however, that uh, it isn't always customary when a pilot takes a plane out and it isn't working properly to bring it back. They usually change pilots rather than planes uh, because they haven't got too many planes. But I was glad that they changed planes this time instead of pilots. <laughs> At least we got to uh, Istanbul where our missionary brothers and sisters met us and some uh, other folks from the Istanbul congregation. From here on, it was a very cold trip. The weather was stormy in Istanbul. We drove in from the airport in a taxi that is owned and operated by a brother, and he put it at our disposal, no matter where we wanted to go during the day, to meetings and assemblies in different homes while he was always there to take us. And then, uh, this made it most convenient. It is hard to get a taxi in Istanbul because the usual way of running their taxis is they have routes from one place to another and just people get in and you pay a fare. It makes it wonderful for our missionaries, as Sister Anna Mathiaki, a graduate of Gilead, said, if it wasn't for that taxi service in Istanbul, she'd never be able to carry on her many, many Bible studies, about 25 that she conducts every week. And she doesn't do it just in uh, one language. She has to do it in Greek, in Turkish, in French, and some Spanish. And uh, she has to struggle along a little bit with Arabic. There are about eight or nine principal languages that are used in Turkey. So a person has to have almost a gift of tongues in order to be a good witness there. However, the Holy Spirit doesn't operate us on, on us today to speak in tongues. We have to learn the hard way, and Sister Annie Mathiaki has. She studies diligently and speaks Turkish fluently now. When I was there five years ago, the brothers had arranged to have the meeting in, a, in an Armenian church. Uh, the churches aren't too prosperous over there, so they have no objections to renting out their building to other religious organizations. <laughs> but the law in Turkey is that you cannot have a religious assembly in any place except a church, one that is approved and recognized by the government. 
So this time they tried to get the Armenian Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Baptist Church, and anybody else's church, but they wouldn't uh, rent to Jehovah's Witnesses this time because we are making too much progress. There are too many people leaving those churches and associating themselves with Jehovah's Witnesses. So our brothers were in quite a quandary as what they were going to do in order to have Brother Franz and Brother Hoffman and myself speak to them as a group. Of course, we could move around from home to home, as we did, but the thing was get all the brothers together that adds so much to uh, an assembly. Well, somebody had the bright idea. There was a, two missionaries there, a brother and a sister, and sometimes when a boy and a girl are together, they talk a little bit and a little bit more, and pretty soon they think they ought to be engaged. So uh, they thought, well, we ought to get engaged and get married one of these days. So uh, it's customary in Istanbul when people get engaged that you put on a big celebration. <laughs> so they said, well, we'll get engaged and uh, we'll announce it. And that way we can run a big hall and we can have a little banquet and a celebration together about our engagement. And then we can have all the discourses by Brother Franz and Brother Nor. <laughs> so, uh, Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, all the brothers started to assemble at a casino that the brothers had rented. They were having a study with the man that owned it. He was a man of goodwill. So uh, he was very pleased to give it to us. Of course, you have to register it with the police. So the young lady and the young man had to go to the police and tell them they were engaged and they wanted to have a celebration. And they really are engaged. They're going to get married. <laughs> I thought that's gone pretty far to have a meeting. <laughs> but as long as it keeps them both in Turkey, why, that's perfectly all right. So they came to the, all of our folks came to the meeting about 191 in the morning, and then they had told all of their people of goodwill about a meeting in the afternoon, which was a public meeting. Of course, no one was told it was public, and you could only get in by special invitation. We had... Uh, Brothers stationed at the door that knew practically every one, at least the two of them did. And so if the police would come to check on the meeting, why it would have to change a little bit as far as the lectures were concerned. So the speakers were informed that if you get the high sign from the man at the door, then you know the police are coming in and then you want to give some good sound counsel and advice to the newly married <laughs> ones. So you might have to change from directing overseers to telling married people now how they ought to live together after they get married. We were all prepared, but the police never did come. We were very glad for that, and our program went on all day from 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We had uh, lunch at noontime, and of course they had their regular caterers there who served the tea and the coffee and the little cookies and other things we had to eat, and then we could sit around in groups and at tables and talk, which we did for about two hours at noon. And the public meeting went on in the afternoon, and I, as I remember, there were about 233 present at the public meeting. Well, we had a wonderful time, but in the whole day, it was so filled with discourses and counsel and experiences that I don't think they ever got around to announce their engagement. <laughs> They may have to use that again sometime <laughs> to get this thing done officially. When I met with the servants that evening, uh, there were about 40 who are servants or might be servants someday. We have to break up our congregation into small groups of 10 and 15 because we can't meet in a kingdom hall like we do, so we need many servants. So for about two hours on Sunday evening, I talked to the servants about their problems and responsibilities. And I suggested then that uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't carry on the work in Istanbul the way we do in other countries and have circuit assemblies every six months. I said, surely amongst all of the brothers here, there should be somebody celebrating a wedding anniversary <laughs> or the birth of a child or uh, something ought to happen every six months in this city. 
get all of the brothers together and have a circuit assembly. And they thought that they could uh, find out from the congregation enough excuses to go to this casino. I'm sure it will do the work a lot of good. There is an interesting thing in Istanbul. There are many Jews and Jewesses that are becoming interested in the truth. In the last year and a half, there are about uh, 35 Spanish-speaking Jews that have come into the truth, and they are very zealous. And they're, as you know, the Jews are quite clannish, and uh, they go to their own Jewish friends, and they preach the truth and start studies, and it isn't long until they're right in the congregation. There are many very new people that hadn't dedicated yet Jewish that uh, were assembling with us in our meetings. So the work in Istanbul is moving along very well. There are two uh, ideas of thought amongst the brothers. The uh, Muslim brothers, or the Turkish people, uh, they want to just go out and blast the country with the truth. They don't want to uh, pull in the least bit. But the others, who are Greeks mainly, and uh, Jewish people, they're a little bit hesitant in uh, hitting too hard. They do house-to-house work, but when they meet a Muslim, they always, rather than offering a magazine in the Turkish language, they offer it in the Spanish, or the French, or the German. And uh, letting the Muslim or the Turk know, well, we haven't, we're not coming to you to change your religion, we are looking for the people who speak other languages. But it was most interesting in this meeting to talk to the Turkish brothers who were born and raised in Turkey and who were raised in the Muslim religion, although it never took, they just were born Muslims, but they never paid any attention to it, and now they've taken to the truth. And they feel that more energy should be put forth, and they do it themselves. So we had a discussion, and there was a little bit of a, a problem had arisen amongst the brothers as to which way it should be done. The Greeks, who are a persecuted people in Turkey, uh, wanted to soften the message. And the Turks, who of course have the freedom of the country being nationals, they wanted to push it right to the top and blast the roof off if that's possible. So uh, every time that somebody refused to get excited, like the Turkish brothers did, why there was a little wrangle and a, you might say, an internal persecution finding fault with one another and complaining because uh, if a person wasn't uh, real energetic with everybody he met at the door, then they said, well, uh, you're not in the truth. You're, you're pussyfoot and you're soft. You're, there's no reason why you ought to come to meetings. And there was quarreling. So I pointed out to the brothers, as long as we have no recognition in the country and we don't, then no one should complain with another person's method of witnessing. If they want to go out and talk to people and be cautious, then let them be cautious. And you who do not want to be cautious and want to drive right straight through, well, well and good. It was pointed out, however, after careful questioning of those who were soft peddling, that uh, nothing had happened in the way of peace interference for the last two years. And the congregation has grown very, very much in that particular time. We are, however, trying to establish ourselves legally. And much time was spent talking to brothers about going to... When we once have recognition, there will be very little difficulty in Turkey as to the preaching of the truth. While there are about 26 million Muslims in the country, there are just about 2 million that practice the Mohammedan religion. The others are very, very passive in their beliefs. It was really a pleasure to be with these brothers because they have problems, real problems, but they're making wonderful progress. The morning we were to leave for Beirut or for Greece, one or the other, we had a telephone call from Brother Idreus saying that he did not have any visa or there was not any visa at the British Consul's office, so there was no real reason then to return to Athens and go to Cyprus because we couldn't have gotten in without a visa. 
So we flew on to Beirut that night, arrived about midnight, and there were about 30 brothers in Lebanon that were uh, waiting us at the airport. Brother Franz, Brother Hoffman, and I flew there. One newspaper woman came up and wanted to know if I was going to speak to the president and the prime minister while I was there. I didn't know anything about speaking to him, but I was willing to if they wanted me to. <laughs> but uh, I said I didn't know of any appointment. I've just arrived, but uh, I would very much like to. Of course, I didn't tell her that our magazine was banned, The Watchtower. <laughs> and that was one reason I would have liked to spoken to uh, one of the officials in government about our problem. The work in uh, Lebanon is going on very well, but there is a certain amount of persecution and pressure brought to bear against us. Because recently, last June or July, a ban was put on the Watchtower, and in the publication, uh, which stated the reasons for putting on the ban, it said that we were pro-Zionist. And of course that means we're in favor of the Jews or the Israeli nation. Well, of course, uh, we're spreading that propaganda around amongst the Arabs while they look down upon us. And uh, they're liable to cause some trouble or disturbance because we use the name Jehovah and call ourselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Of course, the Jews don't use that name at all. But still, they like to tie us in with Zionism. Well, we thought that the Arabs were behind this whole matter. So I spoke to Brother Atiyah, Shamil Atiyah, and he has some influence in the country, works for a large firm there, who is the president, is a very good friend of the prime minister's. So he said, uh, I'll try and make an appointment for you to see the prime minister or the president while you are here. I says, well, any time of the day or the night that you can, why, I'll be ready to go. No matter where I am, I'll come here during this particular week, seven days, and uh, talk to him because something has to be done about the lifting of this ban. In the meantime, there was a lot of work to be done in the branch office because a new branch servant had just taken over a few months ago and he was taken from the missionary group and had no special training in Brooklyn. So a lot of time had to be devoted to him. Also meetings were held with the missionaries and talked over their problems and also all of the pioneers and special pioneers in the country. A convention was held, and a very successful one too, and a public meeting, and there were no disturbances. The Monday following the convention, we went to Tripoli, and there there were over 290 uh, attended a meeting in their Kingdom Hall. It was at Tripoli that I learned by phone message from Brother Atiyah that I could see the Prime Minister the next day at 10 o'clock, or 10.30. So we had a rush back in the morning, and uh, several of the prominent brothers who had been in the truth for many, many years and have prestige went with me. So we called on the prime minister, and he was very courteous. He, uh, there were five of us in the group. He offered us all cigarettes, and of course none of us smoked. And he frowned a little bit and said, well, uh, if none of you fellows smoke, uh, of course, he was speaking in Arabic. He said, if none of you people smoke, well, you ought to save an awful lot of money during the year. So he said, I suggest that all the money you save, you give to the poor. I don't know if he meant we should give it to him or not. <laughs> but uh, at least the suggestion was made, we save our money and give it to somebody. So uh, he wanted to know our problem and the reason for our calling. So I stated it very briefly that our magazine, The Watchtower, was banned. And the only other countries that The Watchtower was banned was in the communistic countries like Russia and Poland and those countries behind the Iron Curtain. I made this statement first because I knew that the former government in Lebanon was communistic in tendency. And the present government crowded them out and put on a real fight to get them out of power because this present government is really hot against communism. They want to be with the West. So I thought I'd tie in this ban against the Watchtower along with the thing that this government hates, and that is communism. And my next statement was in regards to the charge in the 
law which said that we were pro-Zionist. So I mentioned that that would be an impossibility because the Jews have nothing to do with the word Jehovah. They don't even say it in their own language, Yahweh, nor in English. They uh, keep that word hidden from everyone and they're afraid to say it. And I said anyone that was pro-Jewish would certainly stick to that main principle of their belief, never to say the name of their God. But Jehovah's Witnesses believe that that name should be known, and we have taken that name because God has given it to us, and we have declared ourselves Jehovah's Witnesses. There could never be any connection with Jehovah's Witnesses and the Zionistic movement. The uh, Prime Minister then said, well, I'll have to look in and see what the law says. So he called his secretary who brought in the law, and he asked his secretary to read it. From here on, the whole conversation went into Arabic. Of course, what I had to say had to be translated. But then questions were asked, and the brothers would ask me some questions or interpret, and I'd tell them, and they'd give some answers. But the prime minister was too busy to talk through an interpreter. He wanted the thing to go right to the point. Well, before we went to see the prime minister, I had spoken to Brother Ati and asked him if the prime minister spoke Arabic or English. He said, no, just Arabic. So we went over the things we wanted to talk about, and I said, if I can't talk, well, you take the ball and keep it going. And uh, you know the answers, so don't wait for me to answer, nor even take time to interpret, because he isn't going to give us too much time. So as soon as the law was read, why, the brothers took up the argument that it couldn't be Zionism. So this disturbed the prime minister when he found out that we had nothing to do with the Jews, and then the law said that we were Zionists, or pro-Zionists, well, he was uh, rather mixed up. And we were winning our points as the secretary was reading the law and other arguments uh, put into the record. Why, uh, we, our brothers knocked them all down, one after the other. So then he called for the man that wrote the law, the man who had uh, charged the director of information. So he came up, and he had been in, in an automobile accident, and he was walking along supporting himself on a cane. So the Prime Minister said, these folks here are Jehovah's Witnesses, so, which is quite customary amongst the Arabs. They put their hand on their bosom and give you a salam, which means peace. So he gave all of us a salam, and he says, your God, Jehovah, is my God. And he said it in Arabic. The Prime Minister looked at me, he says, which side are you on? Are you on their side or are you on our side? <laughs> So he started to explain that, uh, well, Jehovah's Witnesses, they are very good people. I have nothing against them. I like them very much. I know many of them, and they have a very fine reputation. He says, well, why this law? So then he began to explain to the prime minister why he put in the law into effect. For a number of months, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, their representatives there, had been pestering him so much about the Watchtower, and they had been bringing in Watchtower articles, which... Uh, he said, reading from his records, that this Watchtower article, uh, the Catholics uh, pointed out to me, say that the Catholic Church, the God of the Catholic Church is the devil. And uh, the Catholics uh, didn't like that said anywhere. And uh, so the brothers asked him, well, did you read the rest of the article? We gave the proof that it is so. So, uh, <laughs> they, uh, so the uh, discussion went on between uh, this man and our brothers, and he said, well, when people come into your office every day and keep pestering you and pestering you, you've got to do something. So he says, the easy thing for me to do was put a ban on the watchtower, and I kept the Catholics away from me. So the Prime Minister heard that remark, along with other discussion that went on. So when a half hour had passed, he said, uh, now what I'd like you to do, he told him in Arabic, of course, I'd like you to go down to your office with these gentlemen and talk the matter over. And he said, I want you to see what you can do for these people. So he sat down on his desk and he wrote a memorandum in the Arabic language and handed it to the director of uh, publicity, information. So we all uh, shook hands with the prime minister and thanked him for his audience and kindness and went down to the office of the Director of Information. There again he explained how the Catholics had just 
tormented him day and night. And he said, I just had to do something. We said, yes, but now we're going to keep after you until you do something for us. <laughs> so uh, we had a discussion and explained our work to him. He says, well, now listen, I know you people had a convention in your... Uh, uh, in the Armenian Hall this weekend, and there were hundreds of people present. Nobody interfered with your, met with your uh, meeting. He said, I know that you go from house to house and you carry on Bible studies in the homes of the people, and you're having your meetings every week in uh, your publications, and we never disturb you, and we're not going to. He says, you are doing good to this country. Of course, it's this palaver they hand out to you. And uh, what he said was true, but... Uh, he wants to get on your good side, so you bow out and say, well, isn't he wonderful? But we didn't bow out. We held to our point that we want the ban lifted. So finally he said, well, you send me a petition, write me a letter, tell me the facts of the matter and how you see it and why you want it lifted. And he says, probably we can do this. We can uh, let your magazine come in, but I'll censor every copy. And he said, when the copies come, you give them to me, two copies on my desk, and nothing said. Why, well, you just get your magazines and carry on your work. And if the Catholics come back, why, well, I can tell them that it's under ban and that uh, we're censoring every issue, and those that have nothing to say about the Catholic Church or not too bad or offensive to any religion, why, we let them come in. So he said, but you'll have to make your request. So, of course, that seemed to be the only thing that we could do at the moment in order to get the ban lifted. So we talked to the brothers afterwards, and we framed a letter. And this, of course, was translated into the Arabic language and then submitted. What the final outcome of it is, I don't know, because things of this kind run slow through departments of state. The uh, officials in the present government are all Muslims. The prime minister, the president, the head of the Department of Information. They are all of the Muslim faith. So it's amazing what power and influence other religions have over them. But Lebanon doesn't want to get mixed in with this Arabic situation. They want to stay with the West. They do not want to be with the Syrians or those of Jordan or even with Egypt. They don't mind those people coming into their country and spending their money, but they don't want to get into war. They want to remain neutral because it is a prosperous little land. The people seem rather content and happy, and there is plenty of money in the country. Everybody has cars, and uh, it is a prosperous country. To get mixed up with the Arabs now in their warlike situation may bring quite a depression to Lebanon, and they don't want it. The visit to Lebanon, I would say, was very successful. While we were there, um, Brother Hoffman uh, flew to Egypt. The uh, airplane travel just began to open up two days before, so it was possible then for him. It was possible then for him to continue on in his trip. Brother Franz and I had planned to go to Baghdad and to Tehran, uh, Iraq and Iran, but uh, this air travel was not open yet. So we had to return to Istanbul in order to get through flights from Istanbul to Pakistan, which is our next stop. I had hoped to meet our brothers in uh, Tehran. We have some special pioneers there. And the branch servant left a day before I did on the French line flying to Tehran, but he had to fly to Istanbul in order to get there. He couldn't fly over the mountains of Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq and Iran in order to get to it, but he had to go to Turkey and stay on Turkey's soil until he got over to Iran. We had to do the same. So we flew back to uh, Istanbul, and we learned that our plane that was to go out that night was not going to fly. The reason was that there was a very heavy fog over the continent, and the planes were all uh, grounded. Even the planes from New York could not get into London because of the thickness of the fog. So they had to land at Prestwick. The next day, there was no movement of air travel in all of Europe, nothing even to uh, as far as south as Rome. All Germany was closed. Trains were just crawling along at 10 miles an hour. So it was impossible for flight. So we were held up in Istanbul two days, and we spent that time with the missionaries.
and, of course, trying to get out of the country working with Pan American. Finally, a plane did come through, and we managed to go on to Pakistan, and we were to land at Tehran around midnight, and we expected that our uh, special pioneers and the branch servant from Lebanon, who was visiting them now, would uh, be at the airport to meet us. So we were quite anxious for it to land and meet with these brothers, as I was going to spend a day there myself, but due to the Suez trouble, it couldn't be worked out. Well, when we got over Tehran, our uh, pilot, our captain, talked to all the passengers through the loud speaking system and told them that it was impossible to land. There was heavy snow, very bad conditions in the ground, and a low ceiling beside, so no planes could go in. So they had to start uh, westward again, southwestward, and land at Baghdad. So in about an hour and a half, we were in Baghdad and landed, and then the, an army man got on, and we were informed that no one would be allowed to get off the plane at Baghdad. The only thing they would allow is for the captain to get off, and he would refuel, and then they surrounded the plane with uh, military men. The situation there is very ticklish amongst the Syrians and the, those in Iraq and Iran and Jordan and uh, Saudi Arabia. All of this is very touchy. The communists are trying to get in and the Western powers are trying to hold influence and no one knows which way it's gone and everybody's afraid of everybody else. So they wouldn't allow any person, civilian, to get off the plane. We did get away in an hour and a half and then landed at Pakistan the next morning around 10 o'clock. The transit passengers were put in one room and the ones who were disembarking into another room. We sat around there for about an hour wondering, well, what's so slow in Pakistan? Finally, the Pan American man came in and said, all of you must leave here and go outside and go into the room where the transit passengers are because they're putting you in quarantine. So we all went into this other room, about uh, 65 of us, and we sat around there for another hour wondering, well, what's the trouble? Why can't we get into Pakistan? Why don't things happen like they do in other countries? So finally we were told that uh, the plane that came in was not cleared of yellow fever out of Prestwick, and therefore everybody had to stay in quarantine, and they didn't know when we were going to get out. So. Uh, more time went on, and we asked people, well, how is it that a plane would leave Prestwick and come here and, uh, with yellow fever charged against it? And, uh, well, he said, uh, this plane usually comes out of London, and when they get the health certificate from the doctor in London, well, they always put the British seal on it. This time, the plane came out of Prestwick, and uh, the health authorities there used the Scottish seal and this man won't accept the Scotty seal. It must be a pretty seal. So here we were all tied up and locked into a room, couldn't see anybody, talk to those who were there. And after a little time, why it was announced that if any people here have uh, yellow fever certificates and have been vaccinated for that, why, then they could be cleared through. Well, I had had to get one of these certificates years ago to go to Africa and mine was still good, and I was carrying it with me. Just one of those things you do. You don't need it, but you take it with you anyway. But this time I needed it. Well, the unfortunate thing of it all was that Brother Franz didn't have a yellow fever certificate. So here he was, held in quarantine with about 20 other persons. Well, I told Brother Franz that I'll clear through, and there may be some brothers outside waiting to meet us, and... Well, maybe they can do something. I knew I couldn't do anything staying in there in quarantine, so the best thing to do would get out. And I was booked to go to Lahore that afternoon at 4 o'clock. So uh, I shook hands with other friends and said goodbye. <laughs> and, uh, didn't know when we'd meet again. But I did get out and made my bookings and checked my bags with the airplane company that would take me to Lahore and kept after Pan American. I met a colored gentleman who was connected with the American Embassy, and uh, his wife was on that same plane, and he had three children who were coming home and going up to Lahore, too, and he had bookings on the same plane I had. 
Well, he was furious. He used some pretty rough language, the language of the world, about the Pan American Company and the health officials and Pakistan and everything else. <laughs> well, Pakistan isn't the most uh, healthy country in the world, and as he put it, how could you so-and-so uh, bring uh, any kind of a disease into this country when they got them all already? <laughs> he says it, it isn't safe for a person to come in this country. When he gets in this country, he'll go out with a disease. He won't, uh, he won't be bringing any in. But even with all of his influence, he couldn't get his smallest boy through the customs. So he worked on the American embassy in Karachi. And in the meantime, while that was going to Washington, I learned later, in Washington to Pan American in New York, and Pan American to Presswick, and Presswick back to uh, Karachi again. But all this was going on unknown to me. But Brother Franz was still locked up. <laughs> well, after I was all set to go, I wanted to see and talk to Brother Franz again because I had learned from Pan American that all those who were in quarantine had to stay there for nine days and were going to be taken to the hospital and kept there. Well, I didn't like that because Brother Franz was due to speak in Delhi and Karachi and Burma and Thailand in the next nine days, and that would have been terrible. So I wanted to get around to see him, and I did. I couldn't get through any of the doors, so I kept walking around the building until I got to the far end, and then I came in on the runway, and uh, not with a plane, though. <laughs> I had to climb over a few fences. Finally, I got to where Brother Franz was, and I climbed up on the windowsill and walked along the ledge and knocked on the window till I found him, and then I talked to him through the window. So I told him I was ready to go to Lahore and that no one was here to meet us, and I said, I understand that you're going to be in here for nine days. He said, yes, they told me. <laughs> I says, well, they're taking away with the ambulance now. I'm glad you're not gone yet. So we talked about 15 minutes, and I told him if he did get out that day, which I thought there was a possibility of because of this man connected with the American embassy, and I told Freddie about it. I said, if anything's going to happen, why, he'll do it because his son's in here. It's a little colored boy. So... Uh, I said, if you do get out, why, you might as well go right on to Delhi because there's no one in Karachi. He was supposed to be there one more day. And I said, if you get out, send me a telegram. And I gave him my address in uh, Lahore because I was very much concerned about the matter. And I said, when I get to Lahore, I'll find somebody up there and send them down here on the very next plane so they can work on the matter about getting you out and work through the American embassy too. So... Uh, I climbed down off of the windowsill and got out to the place where I supposed to be. And uh, finally around 4 o'clock, 3.30, why, they called their passengers. And it so happened that they locked us up in the room right next to Freddie Franz's. So I had the opportunity to talk to Freddie for about a half hour through uh, screening. I don't know if any bugs flew through there or not to get on me. <laughs> Brother Franz told me then that in the meantime, Another plane had landed from another country, and uh, they brought all the people in there with those who were quarantined for yellow fever, uh, yellow fever, and they mingled one with another, and then they cleared all those people through and let them get into Pakistan, but those who didn't have certificates or didn't, that came in on our plane weren't allowed to get out. Even the transit passengers that came in on the plane and were going to go out on that same plane to Burma weren't allowed to leave the country. I don't know what gets into these men's heads, but they get some pretty stupid <laughs> medics in these uh, departments that check up on your health. Well, anyway, I got off to Lahore, and when I got up there, the branch servant met me and some other brothers, and I told them of the situation. So they said, well, there's one friend that we have in Karachi. He's not in the truth, but his wife is, and he looks after all our work, and he'll do anything you ask him to do, so we call him on the phone, and he wasn't home. <laughs> so we sent him a telegram and told him that Brother Franz was there, and we wanted him to do something about it in the morning. Well, the next morning, as soon as we got up, we phoned him again, and he was home, and we told him about Brother Franz's situation. He says, well, I'll drop everything, and I'll look after it right away, and if anything can be done, why, I'll do it. So I felt relieved about that, and then going down to the 
meeting place in Lahore. One of the brothers is on his way too, and he came by on a bicycle and handed me a telegram, and I opened it, and it said, release tonight. So that meant about nine o'clock Saturday night, Brother Friends got out of quarantine. The next evening, when I was eating dinner in the hotel, I saw this uh, man from the American Embassy come in with his wife and three youngsters, and they sat down at another table. So I went over and spoke to him, and he remembered me, and I asked him a few of the details. He says, well, we just raised hell. <laughs> we just uh, tore everything up from the embassy in Karachi to the American State Department to Pan American New York to Pan American Presswick to Pan American Karachi, and by 9.30 we got around the circle and we got out. I said, it was too bad you missed your plane. He said, yes. He used some other descriptive words, which I thought. <laughs> But uh, he didn't like the health department of the uh, Karachi government either. But he said everybody had to save face and everybody had to be polite and everybody had to apologize on both sides and nobody was wrong. So uh, anyway, they got out and Brother Franz was on his way to uh, Delhi in India. We had a very fine convention in Lahore and there were about 160 at the public meeting, and 80 remained after that, and I also talked to about 65 in the morning. You must remember that Pakistan is a country that is all uh, Muslim, and it's very, very difficult to preach the gospel of the kingdom to them. And when our brothers and sisters go out in the field, uh, especially the sisters, they could never go alone. They must go in pairs. In Lahore, and all of Pakistan, there are not very many women that walk around the streets, and when they do, they have a big hood over them, and it's all over the face with just little holes poked in here in the eye so you can <laughs> see where they're gone. Of course, it causes a lot of uh, bicycle accidents and automobile accidents because they can't see out the side. They can just see straight ahead, and they don't turn their heads. I guess they've been covered up so long they don't know automobiles are running yet. Anyway, get they, when they get hit, they know it. I uh, also had the opportunity of talking on the radio for the first time in Lahore. Had a fine interview. A gentleman there asked many questions, and I talked about an hour to the director and other men of the radio station before going on the air. On my return, I uh, traveled through a section of the city that was all decked out for a triumphant entry of uh, the Prime Minister of China, Chow and Lai. He was visiting Pakistan, trying to make friends with these countries to get them into the communist bloc. So uh, they had the flags out and they were bringing all the school children out and lining them along the sidewalk and the police and the army and they had their reviewing stands all set up and decked out with flags all along the way for miles. So we had to go out to the airport through this line. Out there we saw the arrival of Chow and Lai, and uh, they had the bands out in the army, and great big reception was given to this prime minister. Then I was away to Karachi and met uh, the uh, brothers down there, had a meeting with the local congregation. There were 29 present, and then I had the opportunity of speaking to Brother Britton, who finally did meet Brother Franz. He told me that he checked up with Pan American and the health department and then Air India. And uh, he was walking into Air India, went up to the counter and asked if they had a passenger by the name of Franz. And they said, there he goes out the door. So he walked out and he put his hand on Brother Franz's shoulder. He says, uh, you're Brother Franz. And Brother Franz looked up at him. This man was quite tall, about six foot three. Brother Franz looked out at him. He says, are you a brother? Thank God for that. <laughs> so this brother uh, was quite elated about uh, meeting Brother Franz and Brother Franz as well. I'm just in Karachi now for another hour, and then I have to come to here to Air India, and I'm going on to Delhi. But he said, I certainly was lonely for the last uh, day, no one around. So the brother said, well, what do you want to see? What do you want to do before you leave? He said, well, I'd like to see a little bit of Karachi because when I get home, I'll have to tell people I was in Pakistan and won't have anything to show for it. <laughs> so he was taking some pictures. So this brother said he had me 
stand alongside of a camel and he took my picture and he had me stand alongside of an ass and I had my picture taken. And I stood alongside of a, a uh, Mohammedan mosque and had my picture taken. He says, when I get home, all America's going to see me. So other friends had a very pleasant uh, reception after all and he got away to Delhi. I learned after I got to Bombay that uh, when Brother Fran did get to Delhi, he arrived a day early. Uh, he went to his hotel and then went to the missionary home to find the missionaries and let them know he was in town a little earlier. But well, they weren't home that night, so he went over early the next morning and knocked on the door. There seems to be two stories to this building, and Brother Franz knocked on the door downstairs. And the brother stuck his head out upstairs and said, What do you want? <laughs> Brother Franz said, Well, this is Brother Franz. What do you want? We don't want to buy anything today, he says. <laughs> Brother Rand looked up. He says, well, I don't want to sell anything either. He says, I'm Brother Franz. I'm supposed to be here tomorrow. <laughs> so they came down and let him in. <laughs> That's what the... So he had his problems. Anyway, I've had a few letters from Brother Franz. He got to Burma. He got to uh, Philippine Islands. Card was read here yesterday from Korea. And uh, now I know that he's in Hawaii, so he should be back in the United States in a couple of days. So he had a very exciting trip, and I along with him. In the meantime, I was going down to Bombay, where we had a very fine convention. They had the biggest assembly they've ever had in Bombay. A thousand and eighty were in attendance. There's a movie actor in the truth down there, and he wanted to take care of the stage settings, and he went all out like Hollywood does in putting up great big displays on the stage, uh, Indian architectural work. But in their smaller hall where the convention was held, the public meeting was held in a larger uh, public um, hall of the city. But he had a very beautiful design of the um, factory in New York. It was copied off of the calendar. And that was the main center theme of the whole convention. He did a very beautiful job. Not that he painted himself. He had the artists in the studios of uh, the moving picture industry of India do it. And then he also made a very fine display on the stage of the public meeting, too. The people there in uh, India are not at all backward in expressing themselves. They are great on philosophy and thoughts of their own and they have many gods. They have one fancy god they all worship. It's, she looks a little bit like a woman, but she has an elephant snoot coming out here. <laughs> and uh, they have her hanging up everywhere. <laughs> then, uh, as I say, they're not at all backward on expressing their ideas. And whenever there's a large group together, they want to get up and do the talking. On Friday evening or Saturday evening, was I was sitting in the auditorium waiting to my turn to give a speech and listening to the other speaker. And the chairman came up and handed me a letter and I tore it open and read it while I was there. And it was some fellow who wanted to get up and make a speech and tell the audience how he could cure boils and carbuncles and arthritis <laughs> and everything like that. And all he had to do was just touch him with a cross that he had. And oh, he had everything, fix anybody up. <laughs> oh, I just folded up and stuck it in my pocket, figured, well, he's another crazy guy. So I went up and made my speech and talked to the congregation, came off the platform, and I was standing there on the side talking to some of the brothers, and the convention chairman came up to me. He says, Brother Dorr, uh, did you read that letter I gave you uh, when you were sitting back there? I said, yeah, I read it. He said, do you want to speak to the man? I said, no, that guy's a nut. <laughs> he was standing right beside me. <laughs> so he says, well, here's the man that wrote the letter. Well, I said, I mean it. I looked at him. He speaks English, of course. They all do in India. So uh, I said, you are. I said, all you are is under the control of the demons, and you can't uh, heal people with these things. I said, I'm here talking the Bible. That's all I'm here to talk about. And I believe the Bible, and I believe God's word. You don't believe a thing about it. You have your own schemes and your own way of life, and the Bible says that anybody that doesn't uh, work according to the teachings of this word is working according to the teachings of the demons. So I says, you're just under the influence of demons, and that's the work you're doing. So if you do perform any healing work, it isn't from God. So I said, I'm not at all interested. I don't want to talk to you. 
It's all a fake to me, so you can leave as far as I'm concerned. And he did. <laughs> so uh, then I talked to some of the other brothers. At the public meeting on Sunday afternoon, I got a few more letters. One man invited me to take the first half of the program, and he'd get up then and disprove everything I had to say. And uh, he'd show them that I was all wrong. Of course, uh, they don't mind somebody else paying for the halls, and they get up and do the talking. But they are so conceited and high-minded and believe in their own philosophies and ways that anybody comes along with another idea, they don't even want to hear what you have to say, but they want to promote their own thoughts. These countries certainly are steeped in demonism, and our brothers have a terrific, terrifically hard job preaching the good news of the kingdom in these countries. I certainly admire all of the missionaries in India, in Pakistan, in Ceylon, and all of these countries in the Middle East, because they are putting up against great odds. They first of all have to teach these unbelievers that the Bible is the word of God, and then make them believe that word of God, and then bring them to a point of dedication, which is a task. But even so, the work in India has grown, uh, gone ahead marvelously well, and there are over a thousand publishers in that country now. My next stop was Ceylon. Here I uh, landed in the middle of their assembly, and went right to the auditorium and spoke to them that evening. The group is very, very happy. They have doubled since I was there five years ago. At the public meeting, we had over 450. And one young man came up to me just before the public meeting, and he said, Brother Nord, do you remember I asked you a question the last time you were here? I was sitting in the front row, and after you were done talking, I said to you, Brother Nord, uh, do you think I should continue school or go into the pioneer work? I said, what kind of a school are you going to? He said, well, I'm going to college now. Well, I said, it all depends what you want to be. If you want to be a pioneer, be a pioneer and preach the gospel. If you want to go to school and learn a trade and you're going out in the world and work, well, go ahead and do that. You're the one that has to decide what you want to do. But you can't uh, learn to preach the gospel going to college. So he went home that evening, and so he told me and told his father that he was going to quit school tomorrow and he's going to go in the pioneer work. He said, Brother Norris said that no use going to school if, you're, uh, if you want to be a minister. He said, no, I want to be a minister, so why should I go to school anymore? And he told me if I want to be a minister, then I ought to go in the pioneer work. So he said, I'm going to do it. Well, his father is supposed to be in the truth. So his father threw him out of the house unless he'd go back to school. Well, the boy went. He went in the pioneer work. And for six months, he continued on in that work. And finally, his father saw that his son made business. He was going to stay in the pioneer work, and he allowed him to come home. His father happened to loan us his car while we were there, so he's more solid in the truth. The boy continued on faithfully in the pioneer work. In the meantime, got married. His wife joined them in the pioneer work. They're both in the special pioneer service. They're out in isolated territory. They have nine people just about ready to be baptized now in a congregation of about 12 in just two years' time in that territory. They both signed up for Gilead School, and I hope both of them will be over here in 1958. It's good to see these people of these countries to take up the pioneer work, and a number of them are going into this special pioneer service. The Society hopes that we can have 6,000 of them at least throughout the world in this 1957 year. I had a very happy time in this country, but I'll just give you a short experience to show what they have to put up with. The Hindus are very fanatical, and they are people that build large runways of red-hot coals, and people walk across them. Of course, they have to go through a certain training uh, before they can do it, a ritual that the priest put them through, and certain uh, things happen to them. The demons must take absolute possession of them, because when they walk across this strip of red-hot coals, uh, they never get singed or their feet burned or even a scar on them. So last year, the missionaries were telling me a Protestant minister was over there, and he says, oh, the whole thing's fake. All you have to do is have faith. He says, I could walk across those red-hot coals. <laughs> and he says, next year, I'll show them. And they put on their big fanfare. He says, I'll go up there, and I'll show them that a man who really has faith can walk across that and never be burnt. So uh, it was reported that a woman who had gone through the full training 
through the priest of the Hindu religion, had a child, and uh, she was wearing a sarong. She's carrying her child and started to walk across these red hot coals, and when she got halfway across, her sarong began to slip and slide down the side. So she took the child and laid it down on the coals and took her garment and picked it up and refinished her knot through it and just stood still, reached down, picked up their baby and carried it across and went across the coals. The baby wasn't scarred or burnt, neither was she. Then the preacher was going to show him how to do it. <laughs> he started in one end, and we got off the other end. His feet were burned off, and they had to take him to the hospital. And uh, the whole soles of his feet were burnt right off. Terrible condition. So what is it? It couldn't be anything other than demons protecting them from the flames of the coals and to carry them across there without being burnt. It's amazing the things they do. Some of the brothers, the missionaries, in the territory where they work, they have certain big feast day. So they just took some pictures of things that were going on right before their very eyes. They have silver needles. They stick through their arms all the way up and through their ribs, and they lay down on the ground, and they roll, and roll and roll for five miles with these things sticking through them. Sometimes they stick a sword through their neck. There's no blood or nothing comes out. And when they're all done, they just pull them out again, and nothing happens. <laughs> They're all very fanatical. And it's just to get the blessing of these priests, but they have to go through a training. And I believe they must give themselves over to the demons in order to do these things. Now that's the kind of territory that missionaries in Ceylon and India and other countries work in. But their zeal is great. And there are some people coming out of that territory into Jehovah's organization. From there I flew back to Rome direct on the way, the plane stopped at Karachi for an hour, for three hours, making changes, and I met with about 12 brothers in Karachi for those three hours. Then we flew on to Lebanon for another refueling, and I, it was 4.30 in the morning, so I called up the branch servant. I don't know if you'd like me to call you up at that time in the morning. But I called him out and told him I was there. It was unexpected because I thought we were going to go through Sudan. But he came out there, and we were able to talk for about a half hour about some problems in connection with the branch and his visit to Baghdad and Tehran. And he was out there at the airport hearing the droning of the plane above, but it never came in. He was out there at midnight with these missionaries. Then I flew from there to Rome and spent the evening with the missionaries in Rome, and the next day I was away to Barcelona in Spain. There we had a wonderful time with our brothers, and you certainly must admire the zeal and the fire that our brothers in Spain have. They are not slow at all, and they are carrying on the right kind of warfare. Sometimes I had to do a lot of talking, start meetings at 5 o'clock in the evening, continue until 11, give five one-hour talks in one evening to five different groups, and the next evening four different groups. But it... Uh, you get something from the brothers. They're so happy and anxious to hear you and to learn about the work in other parts of the land, in particular the scriptural admonition that you want to give them so as to carry on faithfully in the work. While I was in Spain, the uh, December report was being compiled and they had a 47% increase. 650 publishers are preaching the good news of the kingdom in Spain today. From there I went to Madrid, and then uh, the only way you could talk to the brothers is go to private homes where they'd gather together secretly and privately. And there I spoke to four groups in one evening, giving them our discourses. Then on to Tangier, on the northern coast of Africa, we sent a few missionaries down there a couple, about a year and a half ago, and they are doing wonderfully well. I stayed in the brother's home, who was working with the United States government in the um, radio division that puts up these big transmitters with a million watts power. And uh, he was going to have the meeting in his home that night, and I talked to, talk to the missionaries and said, what do you, what's going to happen? Who's coming to the meeting? Is it a public talk or a talk to the brothers? And they thought, well, it'll be a talk to the brothers. Everybody that comes will be uh, pretty well understanding the truth. Well, I expected probably... 20 or 25 people to come, but they kept coming and coming and coming until there were 58 persons 
packed out the two rooms that they had and the hallway and had to keep the doorway out open to the elevator shaft. And uh, so it was decided on the last minute it's best to give a public talk. So I just spoke extemporaneously to people who were of really good will and didn't know too much about the truth. There was one man who was extremely interested. He was standing on this side of the hall and looking around this way and there was a wall in his way and he couldn't see too well. So he walked across the hall and came to the other side where he could get a full view of both of us, my interpreter and myself. And he listened with tremendous interest. He just hung on to every word. I didn't know who he was until after the meeting and the brothers told me he was connected with the United Nations organization and that every time that they go to his home, uh, the first thing he tells them, well, boys, you're doing a good work, but he says, that's the thing, the United Nations Charter, that's the thing that's going to save the world. He said, I'll listen to you, but I want to tell you about this United Nations too. Well, the next morning, I went over to the missionary home to talk to the missionaries about their problems. The first thing they told me, said, you remember that man who so sold on the United Nations? Well, he came over this morning at eight o'clock. And he says, boys, I want to tell you, I tore that charter down. He said, after last night's... <clears throat> he said, after last night's talk, I know the United Nations couldn't fix this world up. There's no question about it. And he says, you boys, you have the answer. Now, I'm ready to study and listen to you until I know the whole truth. Back in the corner that night, there were a group of friends that just spoke French. Tangier is quite a mixture in language, English, Spanish, French, German. Hungarians are going in there now. So uh, one of our missionaries went back in the corner with about eight people that understood French, and as fast as I would say it in English, he whispered it to this little group in French so it wouldn't disturb the others who were listening to it in Spanish. So the interest is there, and it's all developed in the last year and a half. I had a very, very happy time one day with our brothers in Tangier, then to Portugal. Here again, uh, we have a Catholic country like Spain, and uh, the brothers have to meet more or less privately, but we had many meetings and I met with about 190 different brothers. I spent two days there checking over the branch, meeting with the missionaries, handling the problems of the country, and then back to the United States. It was a seven-week trip, a most delightful one, and it was indeed a pleasure to travel around and be with these missionaries who have opened up these fields and to be with the brothers that they have brought into the truth and to serve the congregations. No greater blessing could anyone have than to serve these brothers and help them to understand the truth and build them up and give them a clear understanding of the Word of God. So I am very grateful to Jehovah for this another privilege of service that I've enjoyed and I'm happy to, to be back here with this class that is now going to graduate tomorrow. So I think you want to go to bed and get all rested up and dolled up for tomorrow morning. So I think that's enough for this evening. <laughs>